Welcome back to another episode of the Journey Podcast. It is I, Morgan Devon, your host. Today, we are talking about the process of writing a book. As you guys know, or maybe you don't know, but I'm going to tell you today, I am writing a book. And it's something that has been asked of me from so many people over the last few years, really 10 years plus since I started my journey, that I had been really reluctant to do because I wasn't feeling as if I had completed my story or completed my journey and that there was no cute bow at the end of my journey or my life or my business to write this book. But during uh, 2020, 2019, as the world slowed down a little bit after during COVID, I had a lot more time to think through, okay, why am I waiting? Waiting for what? Waiting for who? Waiting for what milestone? (laughs) Like I have had a lot of milestones in my life and I do have a really strong philosophy on how other people can get out of their own way to get to the life that they want to build, whether it's more balance in the relationships, a healthier lifestyle, whether it's some sort of business or professional success. And most importantly, when I think about and reflect back on all of the mistakes that I've made, there actually have been very intentional moments where I have chosen uh, to go left when everyone else was going right, which resulted in me having momentum to live a more balanced life now in my 30s. So the book is all around that framework, all around the methodology and the milestones and steps that you should take along the way as you're looking to take your life from good to fantastic. Because I think a lot of people are fine. You know, a lot of people are in their lives are kind of like, I'm good. I'm happy. I'm not miserable. But there are things that I want to accomplish and I'm not quite sure how to get there. Or there's a place where I've plateaued in my life and my relationships with my feeling of self, where I feel like I want more, but I'm not quite sure how to get there and what steps I need to take. So the book is all about actual methodologies and frameworks that you can use from the perspective of a CEO using my you know lived experience as a CEO and entrepreneur, but applicable to anyone in, in their, journey, their own journey. When I was thinking about who I wanted this book to be for, I really wanted it to be for people who were normal, day-to-day, everyday people. People who are working in their nine to five and are ambitious, people who are college students who maybe don't want to go the traditional career track, but aren't exactly sure how to evaluate the right next step for them. Of course, it's really great for founders or people who have a side hustle and have a nine to five or in trying to figure out how they balance their hobbies and their passions and their side hustle with their career and their finance goals. So It's really for anyone who has an aspiration to live an extraordinary life, right? They want to do things that are out of the ordinary. They want to not have the median household income of the United States. They want to be more wealthy. Um, They want to defy the odds in some way. And frankly, the key, which you guys, if you know me, you know me because you're listening to my podcast right now. If you know me, then you know that it's unlikely that I just make it really easy for you. (laughs) You're going to have to put in the work. You're going to have to put in the work for over an extended period of time because results and the life that you want, if it was really easy and it could be done overnight, you would have already done it by now and you wouldn't be listening to this podcast and you wouldn't be reading my book. I wanted to talk today about the book writing process because as I've gone on this new experience for me, I've learned a lot along the way about how to approach writing the book, how you sell the book. So I wanted to share that with you today and some of the things that I'm doing as I prepare even over a year out from when the book will be released so that it can have success. So let's get into it. Hey everyone, I'm Morgan Debon, a passionate entrepreneur and life advisor. With the Journey Podcast, you'll discover that success isn't about the destination, it's about the journey. I'm sharing stories of amazing people who've taken control of their lives. Join me on my own journey to discover the secret sauce behind reaching success with permission from no one else. So here are the eight steps that are your steps to writing and launching a book. So first things first, you have to decide that you want to write a book, that you want to put your story in a written framework. And once you decide you want to write a book, you should start taking 
notes, collecting your thoughts, and just like getting in the habit of organizing your story and your framework if you're writing a nonfiction book into some sort of organized situation. Typically, number two is you create a book proposal. Your book proposal is a written document that has everything from uh, an introduction on who you are, the chapter outline of what you're going to write about. Typically, it has a full first or introduction chapter already there, which allows the person who's going to read your proposal to get a feel of your voice, your tone, uh, the cadence of how you like to write and the story that you're trying to tell and your personality. You'll also see oftentimes in proposals, comparative books. When you, What are other books that would sit in the same category as you? So like I spent a lot of time on Amazon and was like, okay, what are other books that show up in these types of books, uh, categories when you're looking at the bottom or the list that you see in different verticals within Amazon? And that gave me a lot of clarity on this is the kind of book that I want to be positioned next to. And lastly, you include, who do you know? What are your credentials? So a book is a business. If you're going to wind up potentially pitching this to someone, a publisher or an agent, they are taking a business risk on you. And I'll get to that in a second. But what's important is for you to say, this is my network. This is my following. These are the places I'm affiliated with, whether you're part of organizations. These are the people that are basically going to ride or die for me. Okay. And that's important because it helps people understand and start to build a vision around what this book will look like post-release, whose hands it will go into, and how they're going to help you build out a community and initial buyer base for your book. The next step is that you find an agent or you make a decision around self-publishing. So some people can choose to publish their book directly on Amazon, and you don't need an agent or a book publisher to pay you to buy your book. They go directly to the consumer. And if you go on Amazon, you'll see thousands of books that are directly published on the internet. And that can be a really, really good way to reach your customer and reach your audience and your reader immediately without waiting an entire year to go through a process. The other upside of publishing, self-publishing, is that you get all of the margin. So when you sell your book to a publisher and then it's sold then through a retailer like Barnes & Noble, you are making pennies, cents on the entire price of the book. And when you go direct, you are potentially and definitely more likely to get a higher margin, entire total revenue of the book price itself. So if you are expecting, if you think, hey, I'll probably sell the same amount of books, whether I self-publish or I big use a publisher, then you should definitely self-publish because you're going to make a lot more money because you're going to be able to take most of the price of the book and put it in your pocket. The other reason why you might want to self-publish is because you're really using it as a marketing tool to get to something else. So if you're using your book to drive leads for your business, whether you have a consulting business, a retail business, like a a small business that people can come visit, or some sort of online business, you may want to price your book in a way to really use it as a marketing tool that is actually you're getting the value of that customer through something else that you're upselling them into later. And so you might want to self-publish because of that reason. Now, I went the publisher route and the agent route. So I wrote my book proposal and I got an agent. An agent is optional. You do not have to have an agent for a book publisher to pick up your book. I got an agent because I wanted to make my book publishing process really competitive. I wanted the best price for my book and I didn't know what I was doing. So I needed an agent to walk me through what to expect because your girl was busy and I didn't have time to research all this stuff. So I needed my agent who's amazing. Her name is Eve Adderman. She's fantastic. You cannot take her from me. And she is incredible. But she guided me along. Hey, I looked at your proposal. Here's some things that you should consider. Here's some things that 
change your structure this way. And then your agent is the one who will then reach out to publishers on your behalf to try to pitch you so that a book publisher will then bid on your book. So once you find your book agent, then you take your proposal or not either way, either way, the step, next step is the same. So once you decide to not self publish, then you take your proposal and you want to send it to as many publishers as possible. And you want to basically run a process for selling your book, similar to like when you're selling a house, you want as many bids as possible on your book proposal and someone wants to buy your book because then you're going to get a bigger price for your book. And that's called a book advance where they advance you the money of the anticipated revenue from selling your book within a certain period of time, which helps you understand also how much are they really going to spend on marketing this book and how much do they believe in me as an author? So not every book gets bidded on. Like oftentimes most books are not going to get bidded on. You might just have two offers, but it's not really an auction, if you will. My process was an auction, which I'm really grateful for. And so um, almost every publisher that we sent the book to provided an initial bid. And then it was a really intense process where you spend a week, you interview them, they're pitching you as the author on how are they going to market your book and what do they think, what category does it fit in? What would they change about the book? You meet the editor who would be the lead editor on your book and they pitch you, you give them feedback, you ask questions, you know, you just get to know them better. And then basically on a specific day, everybody had to put in their bits, their first bits. And so you got to see, you know, these people came in here at 100K. These people came in here and brought out the big bucks. Like you got to kind of see where everybody was at and how much of a priority you were going to be in that process. Now we'll get into how I managed this process while actually having a day job because it was not trivial. The auction came during a very specific time, which was crazy. But also I have to give you a caveat that not everybody is going to have multiple publishers bidding for their book, especially if you're a first time author. So if that's not your reality, that's okay. You can still have really successful books and be a New York Times bestseller without going through this obnoxious process <laughs> that's really labor intensive for authors, but can get really good results. It still would probably be beneficial to have an agent, even as a first time author. And even if you're not getting, having an auction, because the agent has really good relationships with the publishers and it kind of is like a stamp of approval that uh, they're going to take your your proposal and really read it and consider it because they get tons of book proposals every single month and every single year so you want yours to float to the top at least for consideration so once we had all of our bids in i then had a tough decision to make which editor did i like the best what price did i like the best did I like the framing of how they were going to work with me? Because when you pick an editor, they really have a huge impact on how your book is written, how it's released. And it was really important to me to have an editor who understood my story, who understood my position in the marketplace as a Black female executive. There aren't a lot of business books or self helpy framework books that were written by people like me, you know, that were written by business executives who stay job was not being an author <laughs> or a, you know, business guru, right? I wound up with Penguin Random House, which is a fantastic. I'm really lucky to have an incredible book editor, Chelsea, another black woman. She's based out of, of New York. And that was also really important to me, was just someone who really understood the significance of going from my living room in San Francisco on a whiteboard to Blavity being the, the business that it is today. And so once you have your editor, that's when it gets really real. Like it gets serious. Okay. Because then you're like, all right, what's my timeline? And you go into all these different things. So once you have your book editor, 
and it's time to write the book. So they give you all these notes and they tell you what they actually think. And that's what I learned. I was like, oh man, you were, Chelsea, you were super nice during the pitches. But once she got her hands on that book, let me tell you, that woman went in and she wrote out, you know, all of her notes. She went through each chapter proposal and we worked on a revised outline and changed a bunch of things from my proposal. I learned a lot about how people consume books. I learned that I speak in a very businessy terms. And she really was like, this, these aren't real words, basically. Like, you need to write this differently, you know? So it's been a really challenging emotional process for me because I've had to sit outside myself at, in my current space as a executive and chairperson and CEO and put myself back into 25-year-old Morgan who was just getting started and was making choices by gut instead of by structure, which is what this book is designed to help. The other thing that was really surprising when I was writing this book was how much trauma and PTSD I have from being an entrepreneur and struggling for so long with so little resources and so little time and so much pressure that I had blocked out a lot of moments in Blavity's life and my own personal life. And so I get into all the bad stuff in the book a lot and times when we've run out of money, you know, times when I didn't feel great, when I was depressed, undiagnosed, definitely depressed, and times when my personal life was a mess. You know, I just get into all of the ups and downs that feel like a talking to, about yourself when you're looking from above and you're like, I felt like I was having an out of experience as I was reflecting and really working on the book. So that can be hard to do when you're managing also your day job. And that would be something that I would suggest for people is if you're going to make a commitment to write a book and take it really seriously because you want the book to do well and be meaningful, you have to make a lot of space for writing and thinking and talking to other people in your life about your past. And I made a decision to not do speaking engagements. I didn't take any coaching students basically all year because I wanted to spend all of my extra brain power in the book writing process. That's also why they pay you in advance. They're really paying you in advance for your time that it takes to write this book so you don't have to take other jobs or side gigs and you can really build something that's beautiful. But it is challenge. Funny story. I was running my live auction for the book during Afrotech 2022. So I was literally listening to pitches and getting bids and on the phone with my publisher, future publisher, during the conference, I was running back to my room. It was a shit show, but so exciting. He <laughs> got the final bid. There's probably some video or some footage that we can cut into this video if you're watching this on YouTube. You know, we did that also for a particular reason. I wanted to build as much hype as possible to build up the momentum. And there's no better momentum in my life than, than Afrotech. So if you're a book publisher and you're watching my socials and you're watching the news and you're seeing the press releases, you're like, oh yeah, she's a star. I'm going to bet on a winner right here. And so I wanted to, to use that moment to drive up the price, even no matter how sleep deprived I was that day. I wasn't really prepared for the like race to a deadline and then wait. So what happens is that your editor sets, a deadline, sets deadlines for you. Like my book is separated into four parts. So it was like part one is due, part two is due, part three is due. And then they read it and you wait and they come back with edits. And you don't want to get too far ahead of them because if they don't like it, then you've kind of wasted a bunch of time. The way that I managed time blocking was to dedicate Saturday and Sunday mornings, which used to be my work smart time and my previously to that Imro's Essentials time, but dedicate Saturday and Sunday mornings to book writing. And in those periods of waiting, I actually spent a lot of time reflecting, even going through like my old phones to look at text messages that I sent and photos that I have blocked out of my memory. I looked at G chats between me and Jeff and found the really early emails between me and Aaron, my co-founder, old notebooks and mole skins. And I just kind of immersed myself in different moments of who I was, what I was thinking, what I was writing, how I was thinking about things, and even the vocabulary that I was using. I mean, your girl was nuts, but your girl was a boss. 
I'm like, okay, I can see how we made it. And what I learned about myself is that I do have a strong point of view. Like I do have a strong methodology. I am very predictable and I am very consistent in how I make decisions, which is a sign of being able to replicate something, some sort of success or some sort of outcome time and time again. And so it was also affirming, I think, for me to go back through 24-year-old Morgan diagrams of what Blavity is going to look like. I even look right back like old taxes, text messages of me and like ex-boyfriends and like old like diary journal things of like how I was feeling about dating. And like, I really went back and tried to put myself back in where I was. And then I talked about those moments in the book. Like I talk about when I went to Costa Rica for 30 days for the first time and the things that I journaled about and things I wrote down. And I actually put what I wrote down in the book to show people this was real, you know, and this is what I was thinking and this is how I was feeling. And my hope is that as people are reading the book, they can do their own reflections and like get to that place of vulnerability and understanding for themselves so they can make the right decision. But my recommendation for anyone who's writing a book or wants to write a book in the future is to build writing into your practice of life. Keep a journal, take notes in a notepad, when you're going on vacation or in, when you're in a moment of slowing down, spend time just reflecting because you never know when that writing or the things that you are putting down a couple of years later will be the foundation of stories and narratives that you want to share with the rest of the world. Currently, I'm at the stage where the book is finished. I've written the book. I've turned it in. However, I'm still getting notes on the book, so we have to keep editing it. But for the most part, the book is written. Now that it's written, I've started to think about how am I building my initial sales community? Who's going to buy the book and do pre-orders of the book before it even comes out? I've had a variety of New York Times bestsellers on this podcast. Sarah Jakes Roberts is a New York Times bestseller, Tiffany the Budgenista, Elisa Vitti. I've been surrounded by incredible people who have had this accomplishment before and unfortunately, what I've learned is that it's a shit show to get on these lists. And it is not a practical if this, then this equals New York Times bestseller. What I have told myself is to release the expectation or the desire to become a New York Times bestseller and focus instead on being a perennial bookseller. And a perennial bookseller is someone who sells more books over time. They don't have an initial huge jump and then decline the number of books that they're selling. Year one, year two, year three, year four, actually the likelihood that they're gonna sell more books increases over time. So what's a perennial seller that you can think of? For me, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, The 12 Habits of Highly Effective People, pretty much any book by John Maxwell. I mean, there's there's certain books that are, are staples in our community. The Lean Startup Methodology. Many of the books that I recommend to you all on my book list, which is on my website, morgandebond.com, and my newsletter, if you're not a subscriber, are perennial booksellers. And I would much rather write a classic that doesn't make it to the New York Times bestseller list, but is something that people constantly recommend than be on the New York Times bestseller list but after a couple of weeks, you're not there anymore. And you see that a lot of celebrities buy their way to the list. And then you're like, did anyone actually read that book? How are they New York Times bestseller? I mean, there's lots of gamification ways to do that. And I basically have released it and said, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to, I'm going to let it be what it is. And then said, I'm going to spend all that energy on building a genuine community through my podcast, through my Instagram, my TikTok, and my newsletter, so that the people that matter the most to me, my community, knows when the book is coming out. Y'all are going to hopefully pre-order the book when it's time, and most importantly, get value out of the book and want to gift it to someone else in your life who you think can also get value. It's no different than me asking you to share this podcast with someone, or if you've forwarded a newsletter before, or you've read a post from mine on Instagram and you tag someone in it. You know, you want that same behavior when you're writing a book. And I would encourage you, if you're considering this, to really look into how do I write a book that's going to make a difference instead of a book that is going to get on a list. Hopefully this was helpful for you if you're considering writing a book. A couple of other resources that I would consider that I've used, you can use a ghostwriter. I used a ghostwriter to help me on my proposal. I wrote the proposal, but then I really had an editor come in and clean it up. You can use, I would be careful using AI because the laws are actually very unclear on copyright for 
ChatGPT and Cloud, you know, Cloud.ai and all these different things. You can use it to some extent, but I would not write your book in ChatGPT. That's never going to work end well for you. And you can, there's definitely courses, programs like Lovey has a great program on how to start writing, thinking about your book idea. So there's a lot of different programs and YouTube videos on just getting started that I'd encourage you to take a look at if you feel like you need like an extra oomph to get going. And then lastly, just start writing, like just put it on paper, give it to someone else and say, Hey, what do you think of this framework? After you read this, does this change anything about how you're going to operate? If their answer is like, no, not really, then you, you need to keep working on the objective and the value that your book is providing to make sure that it's actually unique because there's a lot of books in the world and it's important that you're not just contributing to the noise, but you're contributing to impact in someone's life. That's all for this episode, y'all. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have not sus- subscribed to the podcast on iTunes or Spotify, please go ahead and do that. Actually click the subscribe button. It's very helpful to me, for me. I'm giving you all my love, my time, my energy for free. And all I ask is that you actually press the subscribe button because that is something that is really helpful to me as we're trying to rank and grow the podcast listening audience overall. And also check out my newsletter. As I get ready for maternity leave, we will be recording a lot more podcasts but I will most importantly be spending more time on the newsletter when I'm out. Since I will be bored, I'm going to be loving my baby, but also very stuck. And so I am going to spend that time mostly writing. And so I look forward to sharing my written thoughts with you over the next few months. See ya. Thanks for listening to The Journey Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you leave a review and head to our Instagram and YouTube to leave a comment. I look forward to hearing how this podcast has made an impact on your own journey.